Hey everybody, I want to shift gears a little bit in this video back to something that's a little bit more on the electrical control side of things. So I'm going to talk today about how to wire a three-phase motor, or rather how the wiring inside of a three-phase motor actually works that makes us wire it the way we do. Typically they'll all have a data plate with instructions on exactly where to put the wire nuts inside of the housing on it. So as far as just following instructions, that part's pretty simple, but it helps sometimes to kind of understand a little bit of the behind the scenes of why are the coils arranged the way they are, which makes us connect certain wires together. Now, if you've never wired a three-phase motor before, the first thing you'll want to notice about it is that it has a whole bunch of wires coming out of it. There's actually nine wires in most typical motors. Most of them are wound with what they call a Y winding inside, W-Y-E. Uh, and that it refers to not a physical arrangement of how the coils are arranged inside. They're not physically pointed in, a, in an upside down Y shape like the diagrams sometimes show, but rather electrically how they're connected. So I'll show you a little bit about the, the data plate and the sticker and what you can expect to see on these things. And then we'll look at a breakdown of how the coils are arranged inside as kind of the rationale of why do we connect those wire nuts the way we do inside the motor. So let's take a look at the data plate on this one first. So the data plate on this Marathon electric motor gives us a lot of information about uh, how it actually works. Now, the first thing that we need to identify is, is it actually a three-phase motor? Well, if you've got access to a cover on the side and you see the nine wires sticking out of it, then that's a sure bet that this is a three-phase motor. Single-phase motors are only going to have two wires coming out of it, along with a ground. And also, in this case, there should be a ground wire in there also. Uh, but in this case, just seeing the nine wires that allow us the wiring connections, that gives us an indicator that it's a three-phase motor. And also, we see somewhere on the data plate is going to be a pH phase. So pH 3, there'll also be a pH 1 and also a display of the different voltages. This one says 208, 230, which means depending on whether it's a Y or a delta um, input phase system, it might be low voltage, which is that 208 to 230 range. And then both can have a high voltage. Both types of systems can have a high voltage of 480 volts. Now, 480 is going to be a lot more common in an industrial facility where the motors are going to be a lot bigger than this. But taking a look at these stickers here, that's the important part that we really want to focus on. So exactly what are the, this part with a whole bunch of T numbers, and they all go T1 through T9. So let's go ahead and zoom in on this part of it, and then we'll switch over to, to the whiteboard and uh, see how that actually corresponds to the coils inside. Dots are, are nice for wiring, but not real clear for understanding what the coil arrangement is. So now we're zoomed in on the low voltage and high voltage T leads of the motor. Now, on both of them, there'll be line, line, and line. A three-phase motor is going to have three phases coming into it, but it does not tell us on each one of these whether we're supposed to connect phase one or phase two or phase three, but it does say to reverse rotation, interchange any two line leads. I won't cover that setup of it right now. Maybe sometime we'll cover a control circuit side of this of, of three-phase motors, but for now we're just looking at the windings. Uh, but we can reverse the rotation by interchanging them, so we're not locked into a specific phase connected to each one of our T leads. Now for low voltage, we're going to connect T4, 5, and 6 together. That's using a wire nut in the, the of those nine wires coming out. And then we're also going to use a wire nut that connects a line to T1 and 7, another line to T2 and 8, and a third line to T3 and 9. Now over here at the high voltage, which means more on the 480 end, we would connect 4 and 7, 5 and 8, 6 and 9, so each one of those sets of wires would have two wires under the wire nut, and then T1, 2, and 3, each going to one of the lines. So again, we're going to have a single wire nut for each one with two wires underneath it. So when you look at a motor, if it's already wired, then you can see whether it was wired for high or low voltage. If it has four wire nuts, each with three wires under it, it's made for low voltage, so 208 to 240 would be safe. If it has six wire nuts with two wires underneath each one, then we know it was higher, wired for a high voltage. We need to make sure that unless you're gonna rewire it, we need to use the same wiring connections that were meant for the original wiring. That's what we're supposed to supply to it. But the cool thing is that all you have to do is take off the wire nuts and rewire it, and you can connect the same motor to either a low or a high voltage system, and you'll still be able to get the full one horsepower out of it. So let's take a look at how those connections look inside. 
So inside of this motor, there are three individual sets of windings that allow current to flow through them and creating the magnetic field. But those three sets of windings are not all each on their same side of the motor. So if we kind of thought about a cutaway view of the motor, here's the center of the motor. We don't have a coil on one side, a coil on the second side, and a coil on the third side, all equally spaced from each other. If we did that, then as we apply the magnetic field, we're going to apply just a force on one side at a time, and that would get a real une uneven rotation. I imagine it kind of like if you hang a big wheel on the wall and give it a spin on one side, it'll kind of wobble a little bit, unless you take it and push on one side and pull on the other equally, then we can apply a more even force. So instead, this winding, so if we'll call this winding one, it's actually separated into two sets. So we'll call it one A and one B on opposite sides of the motor. So they can both apply a rotational force, but make it more even so that it gently and smoothly rotates. Same here, we'll call this two, two A, 2B, and obviously when they design it, they can design it a lot more consistently. I don't have exact uh, dimensions between these, but you see how it's on opposite sides. And then finally, if we have three, we'll call it 3A and 3B, again, on opposite sides. So really three phases are actually split up into six coils. Now, since we had those wire numbers on the motor, if we redraw those, and let me redraw them a little bit more like a, a physical perspective of what that'll look like inside the motor. Ooh, that's not, not very clean there. Clean my whiteboard off. We'll draw our six coils, and I'll just represent them as little schematic versions of a, a coil here. And in the center of the motor, they do something kind of interesting. They're, they're all bonded together inside the motor. At one point, three of those coils are all bonded together and that's why it gets the name Y, because this is like an upside down Y. W-Y-E, not W-H-Y, W-Y-E, because it's like an upside down Y. Now, if, so we can see that there's three, the three sets of coils, but the t it turns out that there's six total individual coils inside, but three of them, which is a preset inside, you can't access this point. You don't get to unwire these points. They're, they're bonded inside. But now let's give it the numbers that we can refer back to that motor data plate and see what those look like. So this is T1, T2, T3. And then we can get to the other side of it, T4, T5, and T6. So each one of these coils on the outside, we can get to both ends. The three on the inside, we only get to one end. So T456, T7, T8, and T9, okay? So there's our nine wires that are sticking out of the motor. So they're the both ends of three of the coils, but only one end of the remaining three coils. Now for the high voltage, which is probably a little bit more common in industrial setting, uh, low voltage might be useful if you've got a, a shop or a classroom or something like that, then you probably have a lower voltage three phase coming into the room. Uh, but if we're hooking this a, a large horsepower motor up, then we're probably going to use the high voltage setting. And high voltage means we need to have as many resistors, which are the coils, as possible in series for a higher voltage. Therefore, according to the voltage divider principle, that high voltage is split up equally among four series coils. So each one of them will get a lower voltage, exactly one quarter of the full voltage. So if I connect a phase input here, so we'll call this phase one or line one, like we might see. Uh, yeah, I'll use L, L1, L2, and L3 for line. So line one, line two, line three. Now, if I bond these ones together using a wire nut, Remember how we said that in high voltage, you'll see six wire nuts, each with two wires? Well, here are six wire nuts, each with two wires. One goes to a phase, two goes to a phase, and three goes to a phase. And four to seven, five to eight, and six to nine are all bonded together inside. So that gives us the setup of how we would wire it for high voltage. And if this is 480 volts... 480 between phases, each one will get 120 volts for one, two, three, and four, no matter which of these sets of T leads that we're looking between.
And if they each get 120 volts with a constant amount of resistance, then we can guarantee that they're each going to develop a certain amount of horsepower or lead to the motor generating a certain amount of horsepower. So important number to keep in mind right there, 120 volts on every coil when it's in high voltage wired for high voltage mode. So good to know. Now let's switch over. I'll go and erase this and let's take a look at the low voltage winding as well. Now we're going to wire this thing for low voltage. So the low voltage winding cannot change the fact that this is that little upside down W, that Y shape, sorry, a Y shape inside. But what we can do is kind of mentally rearrange this. It's going to get a little bit tricky. It's a little bit weird to think about, um, but we'll go back and look at the voltages and see how those actually um, match up. Because if we want the same amount of horsepower, regardless of how our wiring is, I mean, the thing's a one horsepower motor. Hopefully that should be the same no matter what wires we hook it up to. We need to make sure that that 120 volts is still present on every coil. If it is, we know we'll generate the same horsepower. So using it for lower voltage, lower voltage is not putting all the coils in series with each other, but rather we're going to take these three, the ones that we can access both sides, and we're going to take one end of each and tie them together so they actually form a second one of these little upside down Y's in here. Then we'll be able to tie the incoming line wires to both of those little upside down Y's. So I'm going to erase these three coils and basically redraw them by themselves over here next to this one. So it's like creating two of these little tiny things parallel with each other. In fact, that's the whole key here. The last one was connected with all those coils in series with each other. Series allows higher voltages to be dropped on single coils. But in parallel, which is the way we're going to design this, it allows those voltages to be dropped side by side with each other, which means a lower source voltage needs to be separated over fewer resistors. So we'll redraw this one. Okay, so I've redrawn them a little bit for clarity here. Now these two sets of coils side by side represent the way that this one is uh, connected internally with its uh, the permanently bonded set that you can't get to. But now you see over here, if we were to simply take T4, 5, and 6 and bond those together, then we would have two identical upside down Y setups, the WYE. Now, if we were to do this, there's only three other connections that need to be made. So like I said, we've got four different wire nuts. This one's going to have three wires under it. Now we're going to take T7 and T1 and tie those to line one. We're going to take T8 and T2 and tie those to line 2. And then we're going to take T9 and T3, bond those together and tie them to L3. Now those don't always have to be done in that exact order, like line 1, line 2, line 3. But what you do have to do is tie T2 to T8. You can't just decide to tie T2 to T9. Uh, because it wouldn't work. T2 has to be connected to T8, but after that they can be connected to whichever of the phases is required in order to drive it the right direction. Now, T4, 5, and 6 all together, T4, T5, and T6 are on the diagram all going to get bonded together. T1 goes to T7, which goes to L1, so we'll see T1, T7, and L with bonds. T2, T8 and L, so T2, T8 and L, that's also going to get bonds, and finally T3 and T9, T3, T9, and those finally get connected to the third line of input. So we can see that no matter whether we connect it in high or low voltage, we're still going to have this setup that connects all of them together. Now, if this is low voltage, let's say 240 volts. It could be 208 to 240, depending on the input voltage system. But if it's 240, we can see that from here, we have two resistors, two coils in series to get from L1 to L2. According to the voltage divider rule, if they're equal resistors, they'll get equal voltage, and that'll be 120. Now, there's also a second path that we'll take. So those ones will also get 120. Therefore, at any time with 240, there are four coils getting 120 volts. That was exactly the same with the 480 setup. So the amount of power generated by each one of the coils is the same as it was before. The downside of using 240 volts is that with two paths of current and both of those paths having less resistance than the one path before, we're going to consume a lot more current. And that 120 volts for this coil, that was equal to the 120 volts for that coil. That coil 
doesn't really know that it's being fed by 240 as opposed to 480. So as far as the behavior of the coils inside the motor, even though we're supplying them with 480, it's not like each one of these coils individually is getting overpowered or at risk for burning up like we might expect if we just supplied more voltage. If your motor is wired for 240 though, do not connect it to 480. Otherwise those coils are all gonna be getting two times the amount of voltage and then they are gonna fail. If you have a motor that's wired for 480 and you connect 240 to it, you won't be at risk of damaging the motor, but it's not going to operate because each one of those coils that was expecting 120 is only going to be getting half the amount of voltage. Therefore, it's going to be generating a lot less power and you probably won't even see the motor rotating at all. It's just going to be too weak. So definitely never hook up a low voltage winding motor to a high voltage source. Big no-no there. These motors are really cool to use and they're a lot of fun and pretty easy to understand once you see how the stuff is arranged inside. It's just a little harder because as difficult as electricity is, to, you can't see how it works, you can't see it move. You also can't see inside the big metal case and it's really hard to imagine actually what's going on inside. So usually all we can do is just kind of memorize what's on the data plate and hope it's good enough. So I hope this video kind of clarified a little bit if you've ever been curious about how these motors were actually wired up in use if you've ever seen them before. Uh, and if you have any other questions or any other comments about it, please feel free to let me know. I always love to learn more about uh, especially the electric motors and, and control circuits for the motors. And hopefully we'll be able to take a look at the control circuits later on. So as always, I hope you have a great day. Bye.